Let's now turn together to the book of Acts and chapter 2. We will begin reading at verse 41. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and the bread of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all, all people that is, as every person had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and sickness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. It is important for us as Christians to meet together. Does the idea of meeting together have anything to do with effective Christian living, Christian church membership, someone might ask. Well, the text before us makes that very plain to us. It talks about they that believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and how they started off being baptized and after that went on to do the activities that are outlined in the text that we have just read. Another way of putting it is simply this. Conversion to Christ is only a starting point. Baptism is the first state of obedience. And following that, those who lay claim to being God's people then devote themselves to certain activities that they should engage in, which should demonstrate to all onlookers that they in fact are a people belonging to God. Our text tells us that God came upon his people in the person of the Holy Spirit. So the God who had come inside them needed to find a way of showing himself through them on the outside and the activities in that they engage in as this scripture reveals to us are those means by which then they show the presence of an invisible God in their lives who becomes visible through their activities. And so we share together the necessity of seeing that when the people come together, they achieve great things. Those of us who have read a little about the now called Russia know only too well that that big nation overcame many an enemy because it had numerous people who when they went to the battlefront, in spite of so many of them being killed, they are still followed a great number that ended up being victorious. When people band up together and decide to do something, great things are accomplished. And the same can be said about we human beings. At the Tower of Babel, the people came together and God himself observed that that people were going to accomplish very great things if they were not stopped in their tracks. And so he confused their language that there might not be one people any longer. Not that there was anything wrong with there being one people, but there was everything wrong with the motive that brought them together. So the wrong thing is not the people's togetherness, the wrong thing is the motive behind the togetherness. And so, if with one motive we come together, we demonstrate what we may call the church's power. There is something about our coming together. That's the first thought we present this morning. There's something about God's people coming together 
that energizes them, that steals them, that warms them, that moves them, that cannot be found in any other way. And the text tells us in four areas God's people should unify in coming together. Are they believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have they demonstrated their faith in the act of baptism? Then they should, number one, devote themselves to God's word. And the study of God's word here refers to our acts into God's word from Genesis through to Revelation at private and public levels. So I should have interest in God's word as a person and study it alone, but also come in the company of those who with me believe the same God, hold on to the same teaching, and study that word together. Much of what we claim about ourselves being Christian is tested by how much appetite, how much hunger we have for God's word. Not too many of us are grounded in the word. And yet the invite here is that together we should study. What we learn in the closets should be brought to warm us when we band up together as Christian pilgrims at Pasbury United Baptist Church. Not only must we come together in the Word, we must also come together, it says, in fellowship. For it says in the text before us, they devoted themselves so they did not just look at others do it. They themselves gave themselves to it, to the word, and to the companionship of one another. Those of us who say, I can pray on my own, I can study the word on my own, I can be a Christian separate from the others. Well, what you are convicted of and what you practice doesn't go in line with God's word. And so you have a choice between your thought line and the invitation or the command that comes from God that he should do all things with others. In fellowshipping together, we begin to see what God is doing in other people, how they beam with pleasure at being the presence of God, how they get excited about their engagement to God, how they delight in belonging to this Almighty. And so we come together because God presents himself in a special way when his people are gathered together that is deeper and richer than what we know of when we're in our individual settings. In the continent I come from, there is a wood. We have much wood in Canada. I do not know how much of it plays out like this. We have a law that once you begin to burn it, doesn't snuff out until the whole thing is burnt out. But think what happens when this law has another put on it. The fire becomes better and greater. And another, and then bigger and sweeter still. And so the bigger the fire, the bigger the warmth, the better the effect. And that's what's meant about ourselves as we come together, we warm one another more and more. And we burn for our God in a bigger way. Those of our friends who get engaged in hockey games and get excited about that do better than we do, don't they? Because they get excited about being together and cheering for their team. And we who know better than that because we belong to the God who has fashioned all good things should band up together and be excited about God and the things of God and speak about them better than people do who talk about things that excite them for a while and disappear with the passage of humanity from this earth. We should come together as those that have a taste of the same good stuff and our excitement about it should be altogether visible. That is what will excite the outside world. But when there is no thrill, where there is no rapture, where there is no captivation, where there is no uplifting, who will get attracted to our God and get the things we are given to take in by our great God and share with one another are meant to be such as help us to make this one the better in commitment to God than ever they were before they engaged in a relationship with us. We have this battery called Energizer in this country or Duracell, whatever may be the case. We don't have that in my country, but I use those because you understand the illustration I'm about to bring better that way. We had a soccer player 
and soccer in my country is treated the way we treat hockey here. And we can see how people get excited when they see Cosby get the pack and just put it into the net. And this young man or middle-aged person was watching this great player. And as you tap the ball, this spectator also tapped the ball under his foot, but there was no ball there. And as this player began to dribble others, this gentleman moved with him. When he dribbled one person, he also dribbled in the audience. When he went that way, he also moved. And when he came to the goal mouth, he lifted his leg to shoot. And the spectator also lifted his leg to shoot. The player shot, and the spectator shot, except he shot his leg into someone's back. But someone who was so excited that they didn't feel the heat, but just enjoyed that their desired player had sculled. You see how engaged we become in things that mean something to us, that excite us, that entertain us? But the question is, how much do we get excited about the things of God? Our fellowship together is meant to be that by which we show we belong to the best of beings and engage in the best of things, witnessing to this God. But are we showing it? And thirdly, we should engage ourselves in the breaking of bread, what we call the fellowship table. Sometimes we sneer at it, just the breaking of bread. I, in fact, I tend to think we as Baptists don't quite celebrate as frequently as we should. Well, the good thing is that we do, but in speaking about the Lord's table, the Lord himself says, do this in remembrance of me and do it as often as you can. That is a reminder of the fact that we who have been unable to bring ourselves back to God and be saved through our own merits, have been saved through the gracious work of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to remember that our sin has been taken away and we've been made right before God. Our hell has been turned into heaven and our destruction has turned into a hope that does not disappoint. That God has forgiven us and washed us clean. He has started a new page with ourselves. And it is all at the cost of the life of his own son. We are precious, therefore, to God. Bought at the price of the life of his own son. And that's what we come to celebrate. God has found a way of making lost humanity be found again. And have a hope that endures to eternal day. That table reminds us of how good God has been to us. And we should not be slow at celebrating it. But there is a fourth act. We should pray together, for it says, and prayer. They got engaged in praying. Prayer is that act by which we say to our God, we are inadequate, unable to, and too weak to perform what is really worth the while. But you, oh God, have enough ability and have such adequacy that they never fail. And so we can be dependent upon you and we can lean on you and be sure that you go well with us. Oh, I can pray in my own home. Good, pray in your own home. But come and pray with the others as well. And that's why to me it's been very exciting to hear all those of us who have said, we pray on a Wednesday. But let's go beyond that formality and just excite ourselves about engaging God in us. Let's come on a Thursday and pray too. That's what a people of God need. To give themselves more and more and more individually and together to this God who has called them to belong to him. Now when the power of their presence together comes in, God does much more than otherwise he would do. Yes, he does listen to individuals. And if he listens to individuals, how much more will he listen when the whole pack of his people band up to do good things? We do read that these people were together and praying earlier in this particular chapter. And we read them as they were praying, God's spirit descended upon them. So the very power of God, the very presence of God, the very ability of God descended upon them. And we can see the result and factor. They all fired up and they go do, doing great exploits for their God. 
In the fourth chapter of the same Acts, they are again together and pray when the world all shakes with the power and presence of God. Well, that's what togetherness can do. And that's our power together. You are taking away from this church. You are taking away from what God wants to do. You are taking away from the means by which God wants to show his great might when you don't engage in the study of the word, in the fellowship, in the fellowship table, and in prayer along with the others. Will you engage? Or will you not? Well, when then we see the power of God's people together in their togetherness, we move on to see the outcome of that. For he tells us in the word that they had all things in common. Can you picture the whole scenario? Because they have come to Christ and because they want to share one witness, they also go out and project themselves as a people knit together. Think of the peace that ensues amongst God's people when they are in God's will. And who doesn't want a place of quiet, a place of composure, a place of calmness? No quarrel, no fighting, no disturbance, no hurts, no offenses. The people of God are moving towards that, moving towards that. That's why there is a togetherness that is sweet. The world has failed to come together. The League of Nations, tending to the United Nations, and so many of these groupings coming together to try to make a commonality of humanity that they call a unit. It has all failed. And it's God's people who are meant to so come together that they reveal that true communion can form true community among a people who belong to God. Jesus, God's son himself says, by your love, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. And as we sang in a hymn earlier on, we said, we shall work together, we shall be together by our love. Oh men, we are Christians, by our love. Do we mean it? Well, it's time we begun to mean it. To be it. To let it out. Were we? That's what God's word is calling us to. That then, look at the perfection that follows the whole thing. What, what perfection? We're not perfect human beings, are we? I, don't, I know we're imperfect. But it says, among them, no one had any need because they shared all things. Think about it. Addressing need and being careful and concerned about the welfare of others to the point to which you address every situation as if it were your own. <laughs> God's people are steer to that. Have you moved into that? And it is as we demonstrate that, that it's clearly envisaged we belong to God. But it doesn't stop there. There is a pleasantness. For it says, with gladness of heart and sincerity of heart, they served God. Won't you like to be in a place where there's no falsehood, there's no pretense, everybody is genuine, and when they say they are who they are, they turn out to be true. Who they are, when they speak up, say, that must be true. Have we demonstrated that? And that's what this book is telling us our friends did. And God never asks us to be or do what is impossible for us to achieve. He is our strength. We can be and we can do His bidding. And uh, I want you to see in the end that it all does show that God's power comes to live its way through his people and he makes them a very specially attractive people. How is that a pastor? The final thought I want to give to you is this. That there is a prospect when we are empowered by God in our togetherness and when we produce that effect that comes from God upon our souls, the resultant factor is that God makes others come to the knowledge of him in a saving way. For the text ends with the words, he added, God added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know the single most reason God keeps us on earth still? Is that we may win others 
to himself. When we turn out to live who God says we should be, and we practice who God says we should be, those who look at us will come to us and say, what makes them who they are? And they will seek our God. It's believers who spoke to those who did not believe, and they believed in turn. And those who believed went to speak to others that they also might believe, for salvation must come from the Jew. And we stand in the place of that Jew. When did you last when I saw to Jesus? Can you look around and see anybody here who is present in this house because you led them to the Lord? If we don't win others to the Lord, who will? Individual and collectively, we need to. That is how this church will grow and these pews be filled. But are we there? But this is what belonging to God is all about. You believe, you're baptized, you engage in these four acts. Yes, you can, you can quit if you don't want them. But the question is, if you are God's, Shouldn't you be what God wants you to be? Shouldn't you do what God wants you to do? But the choice is yours. Will you be or will you?